Sadler Files. Welcome back to the Sadler Files. It's Murray Korf. And joining me in the studio is Daniel McKeague from Perslow Funerals. Good morning, Murray. How are you? G'day, Daniel. I'm very, very well. This is our Lifting the Lid segment where we talk about uh, things relating to something that's going to happen to all of us, which is death passing away, call it what you will, and what happens after that and all of those sorts of things. So, you know, we cover a lot of issues, don't we? Hoping to demystify things. Well, we certainly do. I mean, it's we no longer, or we haven't for quite some time now, hid behind any closed doors. No, you that's know, right. We're, we're a pretty open business and mm. we, we want people to be discussing it. Uh, yeah. We want people to be learning more about the industry mm. and we're wanting to educate the public as to making the best and informed decisions as these times occur. So important, isn't it? And of course, one of those decisions is something that we're all very, very familiar with and that is organ donation. Yeah. So when you when you put your name down or fill out the appropriate forms, whatever it takes, I mean, I've been an organ donor since ever I can remember um, and I've issued my family with very strict instructions about what's to be done with what's left of me. Um, but a lot of people don't quite understand how that all works uh, and and the reason for it. No, one of the, I was we, we put together a breakfast to raise money for ODAT, um, mm. organ donation and transplant, um, last week. Mm-hmm. And some of the statistics that came out were pretty horrifying with the amount of people that who actually do say on their licence or have filled in the appropriate um, online information mm-hmm. um, who say that, they yes, they want to be organ donors, but they don't discuss it with their family. Mm. And inevitably the choice comes down to the next of kin yes. um, as to whether or not the organs can be transplanted at that particular point in time. Mm-hmm. Um, so unless you've had that serious discussion with your husband, wife, children, those type of things, quite often during the emotional stress they'll say, no, we want Mum mm-hmm. or dad left intact. Mm-hmm. So you know, it's it. That's the important part. It's about having and making that discussion point with with your family, mm. um, so that we can start to lift the rates of organ transplants. Yeah, it is so important. And um, uh, uh, I'll relate to you a story that um, why it's so important. A, a friend of mine, he um, he's gone now, but he had a. Uh, uh, a lung infection which the uh, they couldn't get on top of and ultimately they sort of gave in and said, well, look, we're going to have to get you a lung transplant. Um, but unfortunately, uh, that didn't happen. There was no suitable donor and um, he unfortunately passed away uh, because of a lack of a transplant, uh, a suitable transplant. And that's happening more regularly and regularly. Um, I'm lucky enough to have a friend who... Um, she underwent a double lung transplant um, back in the 90s mm. and uh, there's been very, very few ever since. And even the um, president of ODAT um, mm. had herself has had to be able to leave Western Australia and go over to Queensland um, to be able to go on their waiting list because the chances of her getting uh, what she requires is a, a lot better over there well, at this right. particular point in time. So, but, you know, we're really, really not focusing on what we should be doing for our community when it comes mm. to organ transplant. Yeah, it is so important, isn't it? Even even raising the funds for, you know, for them to be able to start to publicise what, what the requirements are. Mm. Um, there's no real government funding mm. um, for it and there's organisations, you know, um, that are trying to be able to support you know, ODAT and try and get its funds and awareness campaign, you know, a lot further. Um, mm. You've had Ros Worthington on the show before, the yes. um, Community Awards winner from last year. Mm. And we're working closely with her um, in a community coffee pod um, initiative um, where um, you purchase coffee, whether it be for your Nespresso machines or your, you know, your, your other machines, there's all mm. different varieties of coffee. It's 10% cheaper than what you generally get it for from, from the stalls and the shops. Okay. And then on top of that, 10% gets donated to charity. Mm. So when we launch this over the next few months, 
um, it will it'll, it'll become quite a quite a large public campaign mm. um, to be able to you know raise the awareness. But we've got forty five thousand odd non for chari- non non for profit charities in in Australia, and it's in um, and you can donate to any one of those charities, or mm. you can get on to Ros's Hub, where she's put the you know her I think fourteen main charities that she really wants um, to be able to support locally. And donate through to the yep. to them with with that ten percent. So yeah. um, th- that I feel is going to be a huge initiative, um, and it'll go Australia wide very mm-hmm. very quickly, um, and start to be able to add a little bit more money into these charities from from what we do every day. Yeah, that's the important thing. So important. And look, you know, I've heard people say, "Oh, well, look, you know, I've uh, had a pretty hard life, and they probably wouldn't want anything from me." But I can tell you uh, that it really doesn't matter. There is always something they can take. Yeah. And it's um, it's so important that uh, people take a more uh, realistic view of organ donation as opposed to some of the myths and uh, some of the things that and that that are uh, are talked about. And look, I, I'd suggest that people get onto things like ODAT's website mm. um, and those type of things, and have have a little bit of a look. As to the statistics, because they're pretty horrifying. Mm. You know, when you when you're only getting a handful of transplants in a state, uh, when you've got you know eleven, twelve thousand deaths in Western mm. Australia a year, um, then it, it's you know a little bit you know terrible in the way. It's quite disappointing, isn't it? That um, do you know anything about why people don't do that? Do don't become organ donors. I mean, I, it's a question without notice, and I'm sorry if I oh, look, put no, you on the spot. No, by all means. Some, sometimes, or very few times, it's, it comes down to religion, mm. um, keep keeping the body whole. Yeah, yeah, I, I can understand those yeah. sorts of things. And then the majority of the time, even if you do tick that box that says, yes, I want to be an organ donor, you don't chat about it with anybody. Mm. So unless, and it has to be a very quick decision that's made. Mm. Um, yes, by, it is. Yeah, by the next of kin in the family. Mm. So, so that you know, if a person's on life support, for instance, and they're coming off life support, that discussion can then 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 be had made. You know, so that you can um, donate your organs then at that particular point in time. Mm. Um, so it, it's all about, as we've talked about with funerals, you know, getting the public awareness and education out there. Mm. It's the same thing for organ transplant. So it's about about, about I guess this show and other shows and people in the community are coming together starting to talk about the issue and the problem. Mm, that is so important, isn't it? Uh, and look, you know, as I've, I've joked about it before, but I really have had the discussion with my, my wife and I've had it with my children. Um, and basically my, my thing is they can take what they want and burn the rest. And now you're having it with the funeral director. And, and I'll back and up I am. the story. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll back up the story, absolutely. But it's so important. You're quite right because um, um, my wife's mother, my wife decided that because uh, we're both really uh, set on making sure that anything that's left, uh, and, and if there's any use to anybody, uh, we're we're most definite that that be that be the case. My wife's mother, um, she didn't leave have anything about whether she wanted to be or whether she didn't. So the eldest makes that decision. Is that right? Or no, you still have to be able to nominate yourself as an organ donor. Okay, um, and then you the the decision then obviously comes down to the family whether they agree or whether they don't agree okay. with your decision. Yeah. Okay. Well, that was that was the thing. Um, they did agree, and um, I was quite surprised by you know what they were able to, how she was able to help other people um, with organ donations. And often people think about organs as the major organs, like the heart, lungs, liver, uh, and that, and kidneys, and and so on, but. It even gets down to things like the corneas from your eyes um, can be used for a transplant. So it's not really just organs, is it? No, it's skin as well. I mean, yeah. skin's our biggest organ. Yep. You know, you've got burns victims and all mm. of those type of things that, that could certainly assist yeah. with yeah. with those type of things. Um, you've you've got, you know, so many parts of your body. And mm. look, there's a lot of people that say, okay, I just want my body donated to science. Mm. Um, and all very well and good, you know. That's a that's 
a, a great idea. Mm. Um, but you've got less chance of being accepted sometimes by a university program if you donate your body to science mm. than if mm. you do to An organ, organ donation. Organ donation. Yeah, look, that quite so, quite so. And so um, obviously you, you touched on the point just a moment ago about how time critical it is. So you really have to have that all in place uh, well before anything, you know, um, comes to pass where you might fall foul of a motor vehicle accident or something of that nature. It really needs to be able to be made instantly, doesn't it? It does. And even if, you've, if you're if you not sick and you're a teenager or if you're 90 years old, it mm. really, really shouldn't matter. No. You know, I think everybody that has got a sense of community um, should really be looking at yeah. the, the betterment of others and we should get on onto the program and, you know, start, start making those decisions. Indeed. And just to finish on this particular subject, I have to tell you that um, the gratitude and the follow-up after an organ donation of any sort is made is extraordinary. Um, you know, people uh, are uh, followed up afterwards um saying what's been done and who's not they don't give names but certainly they say well you know uh, a person benefited from the fact that your uh, your loved one's heart or lungs were used and they've now been given life and that sort of stuff I mean it is just so gratifying to see that as well as a as somebody um, who was a organ donor organ donor and it was a useful and pr- very productive uh, uh, organ transplant. Sometimes it doesn't take a lot to be able to change people's lives. No, um, we we've got lots of programs that we we support. Um, the Lions Eye for Sight and Lions Hearing programs are, are another one. We use all of our funeral homes as collection centres for um, people within the community, not just the deceased, obviously, mm. to be able to come in and donate their old glasses and their old hearing aids, the ones that they can't yeah, use anymore because right. okay. their prescriptions have gone up or yeah. the need has changed. And we work with Lions in being able to um, have any glasses repaired, fixed up and sent to third world countries. Um, Fantastic. So, so what happens in that instance is you might have somebody who can't work because they can't see or they can't hear and you are able to give them the ability to be able to do that and then go out and support their family. So it mm-hmm. changes, changes people's lives. Mm. And that doesn't take a lot to be able to do those type of things. I mean, it's just Quite a matter so. of um, promoting it, getting it out there in the community that these services are available, mm. and you can you can really start to change a lot of people's lives. I mean, we've sent, I think, almost over 300,000 pairs of glasses over to third world countries mm. now, and we've had you know um, optometrists go over there and fit them for people and all those type of things. And if you can mm. imagine how much that's changed you know, people's lives from a, oh, from an goodness. initial concept. Of course, yeah. So organ donation, as we've been talking about, is a similar one. Mm. You're not you're not going to require it. No. <laughs> no. You know, there's no use taking it with you. Indeed not. It's, Indeed it's, it's not. It's like being rich or poor. Indeed. You know, in, in, in death, we're all exactly the same. We are, absolutely. We're talking with Daniel McKeague from Perslow Funerals and we're talking in our segment, um, Lifting the Lid, about things that happen when you pass on and we'll be back in just a moment after these messages this is Devright Homes when you're looking for attention to detail and a uniquely designed home to suit all your needs at Devright Homes we only build a limited number of homes per year so we can truly focus on what you want out of a prestige home builder we've continually won awards for excellence with a record number of wins last year and the proud winner of the Australian Townhouse Villa of the Year. While we love building homes to suit each client, we pride ourselves on designing homes that take into account the special safety needs of some of our clients. If you have a dream, we can make it come true. Talk to Jay Mangano and find out more about Devright Homes at www.devright.com.au You need banking services? Of any type, Secure Force Protective Services run a cash and transit service here in Perth. For as little as $25, why risk your employees travelling to the bank when Secure Force can do it for you? Give us a call. 
at 94405011. You only ever want the best for your family, and no one understands this better than the caring ladies at Marina Perslow and Associates. That's why we offer Australia's leading prepaid funeral plan. It means your family won't be left with the added strain of organising your funeral and everything will be taken care of. All the little details. Your family will have the support they need with a woman's touch and gentle understanding. So leave them with loving memories and leave the rest to us. Visit marinaperslowfunerals.com.au or phone 9388 1623. I'm John Hughes. If you want a hassle-free, very enjoyable and happy experience when buying your next vehicle, Come to me in Victoria Park. I personally train all my salespeople to be non-pushy, friendly and professional and we always strive to provide first class before and after sales service to all of my customers. So choose your dealer before you choose your car. That's John Hughes in Victoria Park, your car buying destination. DL6061. This is the Sattler Five. Welcome back to the Sattler Files and with me is Daniel McKee from Perslow Funerals and we're talking about things uh, in our segment of lifting the lid, demystifying the funeral and dying process. But there's something that's um, uh, troubling you today, isn't there, Daniel? <laughs> A little bit about our good friends in the medical profession. Murray, the, the thing is that I guess I put myself out there as the public advocate for when somebody passes away and mm. what what the best thing is for the community uh, at whole mm. um, in, in general um, in you know in the last few years we've had a instance where there's uh, quite a few private medical practitioners who have started charging for medical death certificates and you know as a funeral industry in the funeral association we we think that's a wrong thing to be able to do mm. um, it's a statutory obligation um, it's not covered under Medicare, obviously. Mm. When a person passes away, Medicare stops. But it's a statutory obligation from the medical profession to um, be able to provide within a 48-hour period uh, a written cause of death. Um, otherwise, the funeral is then, or the deceased is referred to the coroner. Okay. Um, so, the co so it's got to be done within 48 hours. It's meant to be done within 48 hours. Okay. That's, that's the statutory obligation. So, um, But sometimes you may be waiting a week or two weeks for a doctor to fill out that certificate. Wow. Um, we've had instances where doctors have obviously gone away on holidays, not left any instruction, and then we've, we've got poor 100-year-old people that have to be referred to the coroner and have an autopsy. Mm. Um, you know, which, which is wrong at that particular point in time. Mm. Um, you know, the coroner doesn't charge for their services, obviously, if uh, post-mortem does need to be taken place. But um, we also feel that the doctors who have been looking after these patients and getting, you know, pretty good money over the period of a person's life, for instance, mm. Mm. Um, or even during their illness, um, to be able to complete a very short, small form that, that they're obliged to do mm. um, and then, you know, charge for it. And because there's no capped fee, they can charge whatever they like. Is so, that right? you know, we've got some doctors charging $50, some charging 100 some charging two or $300 to fill out a form that wouldn't take them any longer than about two to three minutes uh, because they've obviously got all this information in front mm. of them and they've been working with the client anyway. Mm. You know, I felt like replying to one doctor very recently who charged me $220 for a medical death certificate. And I said, look, I, I feel it's um, inappropriate to even pass this on to the family. You know, so um, the association drew up some guidelines and we, you know, um, I worked out, you know, the rate of what it, he, he was charging to be able to fill out that one form. You know, at this rate, I'd be charging about seventy-six thousand dollars for a funeral. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, it, there's it, it, something it, of a disparity there, isn't there? There is, and look, it's, it's it is a little bit wrong. Look, I don't mind if if Medicare or the government, you know, put in put in a fee, mm. but as long as it's a fair fee, and as long as everybody knows, the thing is, we sometimes, you know, we'll get a, a bill two or three weeks after a funeral service to say, oh, "I've filled out a death certificate for you. Here's a bill." Mm. You know, I'm never going to go back to one of our families and ask for money after a funeral service. No. That, that I haven't advised them prior that there's a cost mm. to. Mm. 
thing is the doctors uh, must feel a little bit ashamed of it themselves because they won't send the bill to a next of kin. You know, no, they won't, they no. won't send of anything you no. know, to, to someone else. They're only happy to be able to give the mm. bill to a funeral That's director. That's outrageous. It really is. So collectively as a funeral director's association, we're, we're trying to be able to lo- lobby the right departments um, across um, state and federal mm. um, to be able to get something put in place. Mm. So, you know, we, we've talked with the th- things like the AMA and, you know, they've let us know that there's nothing that they can really do when it comes to telling private practitioners what they should and shouldn't mm. charge. Um, so we've, had, we've taken out a ad in their local journal coming up to be able to talk about you know the the process and um, what we feel and what other departments feel as to what's the right thing to be able to mm, do. Mm. Um, look, fair enough if they have to complete um, a form seven, which is required for cremation. That that does take them a little bit more time because they've got to be able to put a lot, a lot more information on that, and that's not informing us of the death. That's informing us of the next step. Mm. Um, that we want to be able to do when it comes to disposition of the mm. person who's passed away. Okay. So, fair enough. If they want to charge us for that particular form, we, we've got no issue with that whatsoever. Yeah. Um, but there should probably be a prescribed fee, once again, for that form, because that, that actually varies yeah. from doctor to doctor as well. Yeah, okay. Daniel, um, we were talking earlier about organ donation, which um, we covered quite extensively. What happens if a person has nominated as an organ donor, um, are are the organs able to be taken without a death, c- death certificate being issued? Well, no, not really. Is um, that right? Okay. You know, so you would generally have the fact of mo- most of the time when you've got organ donation, the person's passed away in hospital. Yes. Okay, so that they're there immediately to be able to have the organs harvested at that particular yeah. point in time. Mm. Very rarely you'll find if somebody has passed away um, at home or um, in 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 you know in situ um, that they're able to do a lot in that regard. Okay. Um, so it, it doesn't necessarily affect. Um, the organ donation for a doctor not having issued the certificate in okay, time, yeah. because it, you you can also use, a, say, a certificate of life extinct, where mm. um, a nurse or you know the even the person performing the organ transplant can can issue that certificate of life extinct before mm. the organs are harvested. Okay, so there are uh, a couple of um, alternatives in place so that that can proceed, because it would be terrible waste, wouldn't it, if it wasn't able to. Oh, definitely. Yeah. You know, one of, one of the you know, heart-wrenching things is sometimes, you know, we we sit with a family a day or two after the funeral service uh, or after after the death um, mm. and organise the funeral service and sometimes we can push that out for three, four, five days mm. um, and it's a good thing, I think, for the families to take a little bit of time too um, to be able to, before the between the death and the actual funeral service because they're a lot more clearer mm. in the way that they're thinking. And they'll remember the funeral service a lot better. Mm. Um, but we we can be chasing down doctors for that whole period of time to give us the appropriate paperwork, and then, me. and then we can't proceed with the funeral service if the doctor hasn't given us that paperwork. Mm. Um, sometimes for the fact that you know they just haven't got around to it at the end of their day, mm. um, and even though it's a statutory obligation by the birth, deaths, and marriages um, to be able to produce that within that period of time, mm. it's not really chased up. Um, by the registrar mm. um, because it's very hard to be able to prosecute in these type of areas. Yeah, yeah. and of course the the, uh, the poor people who have lost their loved, one, loved ones or whatever are in a situation where if, you, if they have to, to uh, delay the funeral, I mean, how distressing would that be for them? Oh, very. Um, and we see it happening more regularly. Than, than we have over the last few years. It's it's happening time and time again now. That's really very um, bad. And you might go ahead with a memorial service that's then planned for the day, but then the family know that they've got to come back again a few days later mm. to be able to have the burial or cremation mm. because all of a piece of paperwork that hasn't been filled out that takes two to three minutes. That's just not right. It really is not right, and particularly the charging of it, it's just not right. Um, it's... I'm I'm really surprised that the AMA can't do something about that, or who can't uh, administer that sort of thing. Uh, really and truly, what are they there for if they can't bring doctors 
into line like that. Well, one would, one would think so, but look, we've... Um, I was president of the association a few years ago, and so I've been on this train for probably four or five <laughs> years now with yes. with people like the AMA, and yeah. you know, even the health department can't help. No. And you would think, well, okay, surely the health department should be able to help in regulating this type of system. So we then get pushed from person to person to person to person, um, and I think the we need to get a few of the ministers on board mm. um, and they need to be able to look at whereabouts we actually put this in our legislation. Mm. So when, whether it be enforced by birth, deaths and marriages, whether it's be enforced by the health department, whether it's enforced by, um, you know, a federal Medicare, mm. you know, it has to be enforced somewhere to be able to stop this happening Australia-wide. Yeah, indeed it does. Daniel, it's been uh, quite an eye opener for me today about the uh, the doctors and medical uh, death certificates. I mean, that's extraordinary stuff. So thank you for bringing it to our attention, and I and I um I, I really hope that something can be resolved uh, to make that so much smoother. And it's another example of what funeral directors need to do and have to do on behalf of their clients when these things do come unglued. Thanks, Marion. Look, it's only a very small percentage of doctors, so please don't. No, no, um, no. But don't, please don't think it, it, it's all of them. It's, but it's rampant. It, it, no, I, I'm, no, not but, um, I'm not suggesting. I'm not suggesting. The, the, that. the amount of um, things that you know, amount of times that it's occurring, is becoming more, and it's important that we do try and get all the doctors on board, and a few aren't tarnishing the rest. I think. Quite so. Daniel, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been, as always, um, a very interesting segment and we look forward to catching up with you next week. Appreciate it. Good on you, Mary. More on the Sattler Files very shortly. This, this is the Sattler Files.